Hey guys, this is Miss Bufford, and in this video, we're going to talk about chemical bonds and some of the characteristics that the substances that are made up um, using those types of bonds have. So our learning goals are to be able to distinguish ionic, covalent, and metallic compounds from one another. And so we're going to start off by talking about what a covalent bond is. And so a covalent bond, remember, it occurs between atoms that have relatively high and similar electronegativity values. So this would be that it usually occurs between two nonmetal atoms. In a covalent bonding, both atoms are generally good at attracting electrons, and they don't want to give up their electrons, so they're going to end up sharing these electrons um, in order to fill their valence shells. Remember that atoms of main group elements all want to have eight valence electrons in their outer shell. And there are two types of covalent bonds that we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to discuss polar covalent bonds and nonpolar but I'm going to go ahead and start with nonpolar covalent bonds because I have a lot to say about polar covalent bonds. Um, in nonpolar covalent bonds, the electrons are going to be shared pretty equally between the two atoms um, because the atoms involved in that bonding situation either have identical electronegativities or very, very similar electronegativities. Remember, the difference in their electronegativities is going to be equal to or less than 0.4. So an exam a good example here would be these two hydrogen atoms. Um, they're sharing those electrons pretty equally. They, equally. they have an equal tug on that electron pair. Polar covalent bonds, though, ha um, have a situation where one atom has a slightly higher electronegativity than the other, and in this case, we've got that atom with more electronegativity pulling on those electrons a little bit strong, more strongly than the other atom, so the electrons end up being shared unequally. And if you take a look at this little picture over here, you can see chlorine with this big old mean face. Um, is really kind of hogging that electron pair from hydrogen, so they're not shared equally. And when we have a situation like this, the reason we call this a polar covalent bond is because that chlorine um, pulling those negatively charged electrons closer towards itself is going to end up with a slight or a partial negative charge. And so that little symbol there just means partial, and that's a charge, okay? Okay. So it's going to have a slight negative charge because it's hogging those electrons. And that's going to leave the hydrogen in that molecule on the other end with a slight positive or a partial positive charge. And so again, that's why we call these polar covalent bonds because we have a clear um, positive and a clear negative side. One thing I do want to say about these charges is that they are not the same as an ionic charge. So these are not full-on charges. These are just tiny partial charges, um, but they do affect how these molecules will interact with molecules of other substances. So it's important to understand, um, you know, some of the implications. And in order to understand this a little bit more, um, we're going to talk about the polarity of water before we move on to talking about um, the properties of these covalently bonded substances. So water is a polar substance, and, it is, and it, it is held together using covalent bonds between the hydrogens and the oxygen. So water has two hydrogens, these white ones are hydrogens, and one oxygen. And these are covalent bonds, so this is a, there's um, one shared pair of electrons between each hydrogen and that oxygen. And so um, oxygen is more electronegative, so it's going to be hogging those shared electron pairs and so we're going to end up with a partial negative charge on oxygen and a partial positive charge on each one of these hydrogens. And so you can see very clearly that the water molecule itself has a positive side and a negative side. And so this is a polar molecule because we've got oppositely, even though they're very slight charges, oppositely charged regions of these molecules. All right. So now let's go ahead and talk about some properties of covalent substances. Um, these substances tend to have low melting and boiling points, and they tend to be more flexible. Um, covalent bonds are more sensitive to heat. I'm sorry, flammable. They're more sensitive to heat than ionic bonds. 
Um, and substances, when they heat up, if they're sharing these electrons, those electrons are going to be gaining more and more energy. And eventually they're going to reach a point where they just have so much energy that there's no way that those atoms can share those electrons anymore and those bonds will be broken. Um, po covalent substances do not conduct electricity. So there are no charges involved in forming covalent bonds. So there are no ch um, charged particles to be able to conduct electricity through that substance. And this is not, so those partial charges we discussed on polar molecules, um, those are not strong enough to conduct electricity. So they're, they're, they have nothing to do with electrical conductivity. Um, but with covalent substances, there are no charged particles formed. Um, they tend to be relatively soft and flexible. Um, so the sharing of electrons that, you know, how covalent bonds form, um, that shared pair of electrons tends to be a more flexible bond than an ionic bond, which we'll see um, in a minute. In covalent substances, they can exist either as solids, liquids, or gases at room temperature. So that's a really important um, thing to, to note. Uh, solubility in water. So only polar substances can dis um, are soluble in water because water is polar. So only polar substances can dissolve in other polar substances. Um, so nonpolar substances are not going to be able to dissolve in water. And so let's talk about some examples of both of those. Um, sugar is a um, covalently bonded substance. So the atoms in a sugar molecule are all co forming covalent bonds. Um, and sugar molecules, when they come together, they form these crystals, but it's actually molecules that are being packed together, not ions. And when we put sugar in water, um, it will dissolve. And the reason it dissolves is because it has polar regions on its molecules. And those polar regions interact with the polar molecules of water. And those molecules are just kind of dispersed throughout that water to dissolve it. Um, but a nonpolar substance, an example of a nonpolar substance would be like oil. And we all know that oil and water, they don't mix. If we try to put them together, even if we shake them, you know, for a long time and we get it to look like they're mixed up, they eventually separate out. Um, and so nonpolar substances are not going to dissolve in water. Um, bond strength. Covalent bonds tend to be weaker than ionic bonds. And that's just because they're more fragile when, we, when it comes to heating and stuff like that. Um, but one exception to this is that covalent bonds are not easily broken by dissolution in water, and ionic bonds are. So if we put a lot, many ionic substances in water, they're going to dissolve, and when they dissolve, their particles just kind of move away from each other. Um, but it, covalently bonded substances, even though, you know, sugar can dissolve, the molecule, the sugar molecule itself is not actually being pulled apart. And so, um, you know, that could be one exception when we're talking about bond strength is whether that substance is dissolved in water or not. All right, so let's talk about ionic bonding now. So remember that an ionic bond occurs between atoms with very different electronegativity values. So usually this occurs between a metal or a nonmetal. Uh, but more generally, um, an ionic bond can occur between anything that has a positive charge and a negative charge that, you know, come together and are attracted to each other. Um, in a situation where we have an ionic bond forming, the more electronegative element, um, so the nonmetal, so in this case, in my example here, we've got fluorine, pulls the valence electron off of the less an electronegative element, which in this case would be lithium, because lithium's a metal. So there's fluorine pulling off the electron, and this is going to give the metal a positive charge because it's lost one of its negative charges. And fluorine, the nonmetal, is going to end up with a negative charge because it's gained an additional negative charge now. And now that these two um, ions, or now that they're ions and they have opposite charges, they're going to be attracted to each other. And so that is what's holding this ionic substance together, is the attraction between the positive and negatively charged ions in that substance. And so when we talk about ionic substances, when we, when we do this, you can see it's not really actually a molecule that's forming. It's, we, we use the, the term formula unit to describe it um, because we have this continuous pattern that's being built upon, you know, continuously built upon to form these crystals of just these opposite, um, oppositely charged particles alternating.
So kind of forming this crystalline lattice structure. So let's talk about some properties of ionic substances. Um, ionic substances typically have um, high melting and boiling points. And this is just because the positive and negative charges on these ions are usually not easily disrupted by high temperatures. Um, remember in covalent bonds, those electrons, they gain so much energy and then they can no longer be shared because they're just, they're, there's too much energy. Um, they can conduct electricity when they're in aqueous solution. So ionic substances, you know, a dry salt is not going to conduct electricity, but if we dissolve that ionic substance in water, then what happens is we've got these positive and negatively charged ions floating around in water and those charges, once they're separated from one another, allow for the conduction of electricity through that substance. Um, many ionic substances are soluble in water um, because of the way their ions interact with water's polar molecules. So you can see, you know, water's polar molecules are able to kind of pull ions out of this big structure right here. Um, and if you'll notice, the negative side of water molecules is going to surround the positively charged ions and these positively side positively charged you know with the slight positive um, partial charges is going to form uh, or going to kind of be attracted to the negatively charged ions and so this is how water is able to keep these ions separate from one another and dissolve them out into solution um Ionic substances tend to form brittle salts, solid brittle salts. And so, like I said, with covalent substances, they can exist as solids, liquids, or gases at room temperature. But ionic substances at room temperature can only exist in solid form. Um, yes, we could dissolve them in water, uh, but they're just dissolved in water at that point. Um, if we're at room temperature and we've got a pure ionic substance, it's going to always be a solid. Um when we're talking about the brittle nature of these um, substances, you know, we said that covalent substances tend to form these more flexible bonds. Um, well, ionic substances are very rigid and they're brittle because of that. And so if you take a look at this picture right here, we've got a hammer kind of smashing down on this ionic crystal. And um, you'll notice it's kind of shifting the alignment of some of these ions and making it so that these like charges are right next to each other. And we all know that when like charges get next to each other, they force each other, they, you know, they repel each other, right? So then we have this crystal that ends up cracking um, because those charges, you know, got realigned with one another and then they repelled each other. And so that's why these ionic substances are brittle. All right, so metallic bonding. In a substance that only contains metal atoms, the atom's valence electrons are going to delocalize or they're going to leave the parent atoms and they form this sea of electrons. And when the valence electrons delocalize, the metal atom becomes an ion with a positive charge or a cation. And these positively charged ions are held together by this negatively charged electron C or C of electrons. And so, you know, the easiest way to think about this is to think about phloem. If you've ever played with phloem, you know that it's got these little styrofoam pellets or little styrofoam balls that's kind of mixed in with a slime. It's being held together by the slime. And those styrofoam pellets could represent the positively charged cations in a metal. And the slime could represent that negatively charged sea of electrons. And so if you play with phloem for a little while, you can kind of get to see, you know, the same kind of um, properties that we see with, with metals. So phloem is, tends to be malleable because those foam pellets can kind of move past one another um, inside that, that slime or that negatively charged sea of electrons. Um, and then you can also see that it could be ductile. So you could stretch it into a long, thin, um, um, well, I guess it's not really a wire if it's flown, but if it's metal, you can stretch metals into long, thin wires. Um, but if you were wa doing it on a larger scale, just to be able to see what's happening with flown, you can kind of see how those, um, styrofoam pellets would still kind of move past one another and just kind of, you know, be moldable. Um, metals are good conductors of heat and electricity, and the reason for this is because of that sea of electrons. And electricity is actually just 
moving electrons, electrons that are flowing through a metallic substance. And um, because metallic substances have all those loose electrons, um, if we apply more electrons to a metal, then we can get a current of electricity flowing through that metal. And that's what allows for um, electricity to be easily conducted through metals. And then uh, the strength and hardness of a metal is going to be directly related to the number of delocalized electrons, so the number of electrons that leave their parent atoms. So as that number of delocalized electrons increases, so does the strength and the hardness of the metal. And this occurs because the higher number of delocalized electrons increases that charge magnitude between um, the cations and that electron C, making them more and more attracted to one another. So the fewer electrons you have in your sea of electrons, the weaker that attraction is going to be and the softer the metal will be. All right, so I hope this video was really helpful. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and write them in your notebooks and we can talk about them in class. Thanks for watching Buffered Chemistry. Subscribe to my YouTube channel for more chemistry help.